Hi, this is Robert Mandel. I'm the uh, creator of the Galaxy Rangers animated series. The show originally aired in 1986, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about the origins of the show and uh, how it came about, and hopefully you'll enjoy hearing a little bit about how we put the show together. The, um, I should give you a little bit of background. Um, I was raised in a television family, so my influences are, are, are vast, and all of that uh, came to play, I think, in the creation of the Galaxy Rangers. Um, my dad ran a distribution company, a sales organization, for a British company called ATV, and in the 60s and 70s, ATV produced a lot of television programming you may be familiar with, including all the Jerry Anderson shows, the Super Marination shows, um, from Fireball XL5 to, to uh, Thunderbirds to Captain Scarlet. Uh, Space 1999, and when I started working for my dad in the late 70s, out of college, we had started uh, the most successful show for ITC, um, The Muppet Show, with the Henson organization. So I was uh, pretty well trained in the concept of branding family entertainment and what it means to be able to create licenses. Um, and um, in the uh, early 80s, I was given the opportunity to, to sort of come into my own, and I just, uh, was sent to Japan to work on an um, uh, a, a animated adaptation of one of Jerry Anderson's shows, Thunderbirds. Um, this was a, uh, sp sp post, uh, started out as a cooperative animated venture between ITC and Toho Kushinsha, which was our de Japanese distribution company. And uh, they had a show called Techno Voyager, which was um, an animation sh show. Uh, I went to, J went to Japan in 83. And that was a critical time for me because I, even though I had grown up watching a lot of uh, Japanese animation like Gigantor and, and um, uh, even Star Blazers in the early 80s and uh, Astro Boy and all that stuff, I didn't really know what anime was until I actually went to Japan in 83 and, and experienced it firsthand. Um, aside from the uh, really good animation they were doing on, uh, on the Thunderbird show, I was, uh, uh, you know, um, Watched uh, a lot of a lot of stuff from Lupin, from the early, early Miyazaki stuff. Just um, um, was an eye-opening experience. And um, although uh, the Thunderbird show never really turned out to be a cooperative venture like we had started, I ended up taking the footage back to the U.S. and Americanizing it, which was basically taking the, the footage and uh, recutting it and doing American scripts and American voiceover. What it did, it, it gave me insight into the future in terms of where uh, graphic animation was heading. And that was, you know, very Japanese influenced. Anime today, of course, is some of the most popular animation in the world, mainly because it's very mature storytelling and you deal with characters that, that are very fully developed and uh, episodic sequential storytelling, which is everything I wanted to do in, in television. At the time, in the early 80s, that was hardly being done. Thunderbird's production also happened at a time in the 80s when animation started to make a major comeback in the kids' arena. Uh, and that happened because somebody at Mattel figured out how to make a perfect 22-minute toy commercial called He-Man. It was a hybrid television show slash toy commercial. And um, they ended up selling hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of toys. And all of a sudden, by eight, 1984, um, there must have been seven, eight toy companies all in the business of uh, financing and developing uh, animated product to sell toys. Um, and it was a crazy, crazy period. That's when I took advantage of that time period to be able to put a show like Galaxy Rangers together. I had just finished Thunderbirds. We had a great production team assembled to do that show. I was lucky enough to meet a gentleman named Tom Batista, who was a master salesman. Uh, he was very successful with a show called Voltron selling it domestically. And um, he came to me and said, why don't we take uh, your show to a Gaylord, huge conglomerate that owned the Nashville Network and uh, hotels and television stations, and they were a pretty major force in the television business. Gaylord uh, liked the concept. Uh, they also saw the opportunities for, uh, on the business side, to be able to do a, a, a toy-based animated show and uh, cash in on, on the toy side. And they decided to take the gamble. They had also just recently acquired the Texas Rangers baseball team, so they thought it was a good fit. And uh, they decided to, um, to back uh, the venture. What that meant was that um, they would back a demo reel for Tom to take out and pre-sell. Um, at the time, in the early 80s, 
television business was a syndication business, which meant that television shows were literally sold door to door, station to station, until you built up enough sales to be able to generate uh, the cash to go into production. Today it's different. Today it's all vertically controlled by conglomerates, and then the studios own their own networks and own their own studios, yada, yada, yada. So uh, I had TMS uh, go and do the demo at Tokyo Movie Shinsha, TMS, the animation studio. They had uh, just completed a show called Mighty Orbots, which was very successful on ABC. And um, uh, I thought it was terrific. The animation was fantastic. And they had also produced a show which I, w I, I was crazy about called Cobra. Cobra was one of the first uh, uh, action anime shows that really um, uh, helped me visualize the Galaxy Ranger concept. Cobra, if you don't know it, it's a sort of Indiana Jones uh, adventure story in space about a Harrison Ford type space cowboy who had a robot sidekick and his arm was a weapon, a gun. I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the influences I used in creating the Galaxy Rangers and a lot of the homages, because there are many of them in the series. Um, and uh, I guess it all started back with Jay Ward. I mean, he <laughs> he's the guy that did it for me. When I was a kid, I couldn't get enough of, of Crusader Rabbit. And um, of course, then Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, from Rocky and Bullwinkle, uh, uh, I went on to Cecil, the C6 Sea Serpent, Bob Clampett, genius. I mean, these guys really knew how to create characters and create great storytelling and just make things really funny and, and entertaining. And uh, I think if you had to sum up Galaxy Rangers, I mean, you'd probably say a combination of Rocky and Bullwinkle meets Once Upon a Time in the West, Sergio Leone's masterpiece, major influence. Also the Clint Eastwood trilogy, uh, High Plains Drifter, Outlaw Josie Wales, uh, Pale Rider, uh, those were major influences. I, I love those movies in the 70s and the early 80s. And of course, Star Wars, early 80s Star Wars was gigantic. The storyline itself came from Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven. Instead of the villagers looking for help from the samurais, we have two aliens who are uh, come to Earth looking for uh, help. And they need the Galaxy Rangers to come protect them from, from, from outlaws and pirates. It's interesting because uh, Galaxy Rangers took a year and a half to evolve into Galaxy Rangers. It really wasn't initially a space western. It was uh, initially a, a cops in space story um, called Beta Force and, uh, and uh, evolved into this western because we kept, I guess the most obvious is always you know, right in front of your eyes and you can't really see it until it's, you know, it hits you in the face. And eventually it hit us in the face that this was a space western. Uh, Galaxy Rangers seemed the perfect moniker. We really wanted to touch base on all these great western themes and we had the perfect setting for that. Once we had our core you know, writing staff in place, then it became uh, a lot of fun because ideas kept flying left and right. You know, and Westerns again, whether it's Howard Hawks or Clint Eastwood, it's, um, it, it's this morality story. I mean, you have, well, it, it, Westerns are really based on justified violence. How do you live with that kind of a code? And the only way to battle evil is with uh, big guns. I think uh, part of the reason that Galaxy Rangers has sustained uh, for all these years and is still an entertaining series to watch is because of the writing that went into it and the prescient talent that these writers gave to the series. Um, um, probably include myself in that category, but uh, I think I'll give credit to who really deserves it, and that would be um, uh, Chris Rowley and Brian Daly and Jim Lucino. These are, uh, um, Brian's no longer with us, but um, Brian was, a, was, a, was an incredible uh, visionary. And uh, he brought to the table uh, super trooper concepts and the idea of these, uh, you know, Goose's history as a, a renegade super trooper and having to go out and become a bounty hunter to bring, bring the other super troopers in, all great stuff. Chris Rowley, uh, science fiction maestro, master, master of horror, I mean, the guy's brilliant. Um, he brought to the table great concepts of monsters and, and villains that gave us, uh, that really enriched the shows. Jim Lucino, he, his combination of adventure storytelling and humor um, created things like um, uh, Nimrod the Cat, great villain. I mean, I wanted to strive for some uh, really quality writing and quality entertainment. Um, and I think that was probably a large part to the writers, uh, their, their prescience in knowing that animation was on the verge of 
becoming a mature art form in the U.S. as it had been in, in, around the world, and that in some way Galaxy Rangers could lead the forefront of, um, of exciting storytelling in animation. It was an interesting time because back in 85, when we actually got the green light to do the series, everything was being done on cell animation. I mean, this was hand painting on cells traditionally, the same way Disney's been doing it for 50 years. We didn't make it easy on TMS. I think at one point we had over 390 characters designed, 400 pieces of machinery and technology and props, dozens and dozens of environments and backgrounds, uh, whereas traditionally in the U.S., most of the uh, type of shows that were on, be it Thundercats or Silverhawks or uh, G.I. Joe, most of them were pretty contained in terms of the, the amount of characters they used and uh, uh, props and environments. But I guess since TMS, we're still looking for those kinds of contracts, they didn't, didn't know any better, so they, they, they thought all shows had 400 characters in it. But the production period was very tight. TMS had to break their teams down into three different teams because we literally had about 11 months to produce 65 episodes. It was a very short period of time. Um, so a lot of the inconsistencies in animation quality are due because we couldn't get the A team every single time. Uh, we were able to uh, request the A team, for example, like the main title sequence or you know key episodes like Galaxy Stranger, uh, Psycho Crypt, uh, episodes that we knew were going to be really fantastic. We we made sure we we, we reserved the A team for that. But other than that, um, uh, we had to rely on TMS to really do their best. Uh, to, 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 to give us the best work possible. The way it worked was that um, the, all the paperwork was done uh, in a studio in New York. Uh, the scripting, um, um, the character model sheets, the uh, storyboarding, timing sheets, well, everything on paper. All, that, all those packages were sent over to Japan and TMS would then, would then pick, up the, pick up the ball and uh, they would do the final production storyboards um, and um, final layouts and go, in, go into animation and um, hopefully without too many retakes. I think what's interesting about the Galaxy Rangers is the computer graphics we used in, in, in coordination with the cell animation. We had, uh, and this is something we started on, on the Thunderbird show uh, we did in 1983. Uh, and on Thunderbirds, we used Atari computers, believe it or not. Um, well, that's thanks to David Gregg. David Gregg uh, uh, is a genius when it comes to designing computer graphics. and. And I had met David uh, in the late 70s when he was um, uh, working at Dolphin up in the, the Upper East Side. Uh, we were doing promo tags and that kind of stuff. Uh, anyway, he, he designed the uh, computer graphics for um, uh, Thunderbirds using an Atari, which is amazing. You know, very simple stuff like danger or, you know, words. And then when, he when we went to Galaxy Rangers, he picked up these PC-based systems I think there were early alias tech, uh, uh, systems. Anyway, the idea was that um, we would uh, just take um, cell frames of the computer screens and then mask, mask out the center and insert our own CGI created animation. And that was really interesting because it was still a slow process back then, you know, literally frame by frame by frame by frame to record onto uh, hard drives, which were very, very small at that time. Um, so, you know, the rendering time, I think, was like three days to create that, uh, you know, a small little segment. But we were determined to do that because we felt that we wanted to do CGI characters, I mean, characters that lived in the computer. Um, and what better way to do that than with the actual CGI animated look? Um, also, you know, I think part of the prescience of the series was knowing that just on the horizon, these Technology, technologies and programs were, would soon you know, not only replace the traditional hand painting cell, te cell process, but also would uh, pave the way for all different kinds of animation from special effects to, to Pixar. But a different business today. Then we were sort of crazy. Uh, to us, it was sort of like the Wild, wild West, so it all fit, all fit in with the, uh, with the fun of uh, what we were doing. And we were young.